Hi, this is Tom from zerodefinals.com. In this video, I'm going to be going through bronchiolitis. And you can find written notes on this topic at zerodefinals.com slash bronchiolitis or in the respiratory section of the Zero Definals Pediatrics book. So let's jump straight in. Bronchiolitis describes inflammation and infection in the bronchioles, which are the small airways in the lungs. This is usually caused by a virus, and respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, is the most common cause. Bronchiolitis is very common in winter. Bronchiolitis is generally considered to occur in infants under one years of age, although it's most common in infants under six months. It can rarely be diagnosed in children up to two years of age, particularly in ex-premature babies who have chronic lung disease. When a virus affects the airways in adults, the swelling and the mucus inside the airways is proportionately so small it has a little noticeable effect on the breathing. The airways in infants are very small to begin with, and when there's even the slightest amount of inflammation and mucus in the airway, it has a significant effect on their ability to circulate air in the alveoli and back out again. So this causes harsh breath sounds, wheeze and crackles that are heard when you auscultate the chest in a bronchiolytic infant. Essentially, a small amount of inflammation and mucus collects in tiny, tiny bronchioles and this causes an obstruction to airflow in and out of the chest. So how does it present? Chorizal symptoms are the typical symptoms of a viral upper respiratory tract infection with a runny or snotty nose, sneezing, mucus in the throat and watery eyes. And this is what we describe as chorizal symptoms. The child will also have signs of respiratory distress, which we'll talk about in more detail shortly. Dyspnea, which is heavy laboured breathing. Tachypnea, which is fast breathing. Poor feeding, a mild fever, typically under 39 degrees Celsius. Apneas, which are episodes where the child stops breathing temporarily. And when you auscultate the chest, there can be wheezes and crackles. So let's talk about the signs of respiratory distress. And one of the fundamental things that you need to learn for pediatrics is to be able to spot the signs of respiratory distress. These are a raised respiratory rate, use of accessory muscles when breathing, such as the sternocleidomastoid muscle in the neck, the abdominal muscles, and the intercostal muscles between the ribs. Intercostal and subcostal recessions, which are where the skin between the ribs or just under the ribs sucks in with the breath. Nasal flaring, which is when the nostrils flare out to try and get extra air in. Head bobbing, which is where the head bobs with the breathing. Tracheal tugging, which is where you can see the trachea in the neck sucking in with each breath. Cyanosis, which is a blue discoloration of the skin that's due to low oxygen saturation. And abnormal airway noises. So a quick Tom tip, you should become very confident in listing and spotting the signs of respiratory distress. As this is very important when treating children in order to distinguish between a well child and an unwell child. Your examiners expect you to know all the signs of respiratory distress like the back of your hand. So get good at practicing listing them and saying which signs are present and which are not. Let's talk about abnormal airway noises. Wheezing is a whistling sound that's caused by narrow airways, and this is typically heard during expiration, so breathing out. Grunting is caused by exhaling with the glottis partially closed, and this is done because the child is trying to increase the positive end expiratory pressure in order to maintain airways that want to collapse. Stridor is a high-pitched inspiratory noise that's caused by obstruction of the upper airway, for example, in croup. 
Let's talk about the typical course of bronchiolitis when it's caused by respiratory syncytial virus. Bronchiolitis usually starts as an upper respiratory tract infection with chorizal symptoms. From this point, around half of the babies will get better spontaneously. The other half develop chest symptoms over the first one to two days following the onset of the chorizal symptoms. Symptoms are generally at their worst on day three or four. Symptoms usually last seven to ten days in total and most patients will fully recover within two to three weeks. Children who have had bronchiolitis as infants are more likely to have viral-induced wheeze during childhood. Let's talk about the criteria for admission. Most infants can be managed at home with advice about when to seek further medical attention. The reasons for admission include children aged under three months or with any pre-existing health conditions such as prematurity, Down syndrome or cystic fibrosis. Consider admission if they have 50 to 75% or less of their normal intake of milk. If they're clinically dehydrated, the respiratory rate is above 70, the blood oxygen saturations are below 92%. They have moderate to severe respiratory distress, such as deep recessions or head bobbing. There are apneas, which remember are periods where the child stops breathing temporarily. Or if the parents are not confident in their ability to manage at home or to access medical help from home. So what's the management? Well, typically patients only require supportive management. And this involves ensuring adequate intake And this could be orally, via a nasogastric tube, or IV fluids, depending on the severity. It's important to avoid overfeeding as a full stomach will restrict the breathing. So start with small, frequent feeds and gradually increase them as the baby tolerates. Saline nasal drops and nasal suctioning can be helpful in order to clear the nasal secretions, particularly prior to feeding. Supplementary oxygen may be necessary to keep the oxygen saturations above 92%. And ventilatory support may be required. There's little evidence for treatments such as nebulized saline, bronchodilators, steroids and antibiotics and these shouldn't be routinely used. Let's talk more about ventilatory support. As breathing gets harder, the child becomes more tired and less able to adequately ventilate their lungs. They may require ventilatory support to maintain their breathing and this can be stepped up until they're adequately ventilated. So the first step after just simple oxygen is to go to high flow humidified oxygen via a tight nasal cannula. And this can be called Aervo or Optiflow depending on the brand that provides the machine that does the high flow humidified oxygen. This delivers air and oxygen continuously with some added pressure blown in through that tight nasal cannula that helps to oxygenate the lungs and prevent the lungs from collapsing. It adds positive end expiratory pressure, which is called PEEP, to maintain the airway at the end of expiration and stop the airways from collapsing. The next step is continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP. And this involves using a sealed nasal cannula that goes into the nose and performs in a similar way to the Aervo or the Optiflow, but it can deliver higher and more controlled pressures. The third option is intubation and ventilation, and this is the final step. This involves inserting an endotracheal tube into the trachea and fully controlling ventilation. Next, let's talk about assessing ventilation. Capillary blood gases are useful in severe respiratory distress and in monitoring children who are having ventilatory support. The most helpful signs of poor ventilation are a rising PCO2, 
So the CO2 level is going up, and this shows that the airway have collapsed and are failing to clear waste carbon dioxide from the lungs, and also a falling pH. And this shows that carbon dioxide is building up and the baby is not able to buffer the acidosis that is caused by the excessive carbon dioxide. Remember, carbon dioxide becomes carbonic acid and is acidic, which means the blood becomes acidic if it can't be buffered. This is classed as a respiratory acidosis. If the baby's also hypoxic, meaning they've got a low level of oxygen, this is classed as a type 2 respiratory failure. However, remember that if you're taking a capillary blood gas, that's not going to show an accurate oxygen level because you need an arterial sample to get an accurate oxygen level. Finally, let's talk about palivizumab. Palivizumab is a monoclonal antibody that targets the respiratory syncytial virus. A monthly injection is given as a prevention against bronchiolitis caused by RSV. It's given to high-risk babies such as ex-premature babies and those with congenital heart disease. Palivizumab is not a true vaccine as it does not stimulate the infant's immune system. What it does is provide passive protection by circulating the body until the virus is encountered, at which point it works as an antibody against the virus, activating the immune system to fight off the virus. The levels of these circulating antibodies will decrease over time, which is why a monthly injection is required to keep the antibody levels adequate. So thanks for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, don't forget there's plenty of other resources on the Zero to Finals website, including loads and loads of notes on various different topics that you might cover in medical school with specially made illustrations. There's also a whole test section where you can find loads of questions to test your knowledge and see where you're up to in preparation for your exams. There's also a blog where I share a lot of my ideas about a career in medicine and tips on how to have success as a doctor. And if you want to help me out on YouTube, you can always leave me a thumbs up, give me a comment or even subscribe to the channel so that you can find out when the next videos are coming out. So I'll see you again soon.